All right, welcome back to our newest podcast. Uh, today we have with us Ana Maria Sharic, um, and we're going to be talking about uh, the other side of psychological help, um, not the psychologist who is uh, providing uh, psycholog- uh, psychological help, but uh, instead somebody who has been um, actively involved in, in receiving psychological help for uh, depression for the past uh, number of years uh, to share their experience with us. Uh, hi, and thanks for uh, joining us. Thank you for having me. So um, tell us a little, about, a little bit about yourself, um, uh, how uh, this uh, whole thing started and um, um, progressed, and how, how did you get to the point where you are now? Okay. Well, you see, it started in childhood. No, I'm kidding. I mean, I mean it basically did. Um, no, for me, uh, the turning point in my life about when I was diagnosed with a major depressive disorder and when I realized that something was wrong was actually in my mid-20s. Um, the crazy thing is that I've actually been living with major depressive disorder and symptoms for perhaps since puberty, but I never knew what that was. I never knew that my feelings and my behaviors were not normal. I thought that everybody felt that way. I thought everybody thought that they wanted to die. Um, I thought everybody cried in the room every night, you know? Um, so I didn't, I didn't think that that wasn't the way that life was supposed to be. I thought that that was normal. Um, so when I started to, for me actually, so in my mid twenties, I, um, I, I basically became very desperate and uh, there was a time when I wanted to end my life, but I managed to get past that sort of, and when that feeling started to come back, I, uh, I, found, I, I found that I had to do something about it. So I walked into the clinic for um, suicide prevention and trauma, I think that's what it's called, um, at Rebro, and uh, I just walked in and was like, I need to talk to somebody. Uh, the psychiatrist that took me at that point and, and listened to me, um, I just bawled my eyes out, told her everything uh, that ever happened to me in my life. And what she said was, wow, that, that sounds awful. And she validated that. And she acknowledged that that was real. And I thought that she was going to be like, look, your life wasn't that bad. Like, you weren't financially unstable. Nobody abused you like you were like you're overreacting but she was like no that that's that's real like that's a real um, emotional trauma and uh and that really changed my life the thing that she said to me that stuck with me for a while was that my state was has gotten to the point where I can't get out of it by myself and I need help and she said that I needed help through medication I actually didn't start medication when she told me to. I tried to go like the natural route, the herbal route. That didn't, that worked for a bit, but it didn't work in the long term. So in the end, I had to, out of desperation, again, return to my uh, therapist. And she was the one that said, look, it's been seven years. You have to go to a psychiatrist again. And this is, now it's time for medication. And I started that, actually, I started my medication this year and it, really truly changed my life again like it was something that i i desperately needed but i didn't know that i needed right uh so a lot of things you you said now uh we can go back to uh but first of all i think is uh when you mentioned that you didn't know what it was uh you didn't recognize that you know you weren't alone uh, in feeling this, or, uh, or you thought everybody else was feeling the same, that it was just the way life is. Um, and I think that's a big part of, uh, of um, the message that we need to put out is, you know, if, if you're feeling bad, you're not the only one experiencing this, nor is everybody going through suffering every day. Life is not like this. This is not a default way. And you you need to seek uh, you need to seek seek help. And then after you said um, she validated your feelings, um, I would imagine there would be a lot of guilt in you, right? Because you said you know 
there's ways of thinking about my own life that it's not that hard. You know, I haven't experienced this, this, and this. Therefore, my, my feelings are not justified. And that's not the correct way to look at it, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think that that's, um, that's why people sort of avoid getting help, aside from the fact that there is a lot of stigma about getting help. But when they tell a friend or when they tell a parent or a teacher or a counselor or a boss or whatever that they're struggling, they'll be like, look, there are people dying in Africa. Yeah. There are people that are, you know, the racism. Uh, there's so much thing going on. And, and all of that stuff is, look, it's way worse. Yeah. And that's, that's real, right? Yeah. Like and, there's, and, re there's people with real problems. And yeah. then... And, and look, they are real problems, but that doesn't mean that I don't have uh, problems. And it just makes me feel like you said, it just makes me feel even more guilty because here I am sitting in my, you know, privileged life and struggling. Right. And that doesn't make sense. And it's, it's, it's like if you had like a, a, a bleeding wound, like even like a paper cut, people would treat it differently because they can see it, right? They can see the blood and it would be like, oh my God, you know, we need to get you a tissue or whatever. But if you say, you know, I'm feeling depressed, it's, it's like the, the, the term worn out. Like, you know, it just, it means like I'm in a bad mood. That's not it. Mm -hmm. Depression is, it's real and it's serious and it's damaging and it can be, I mean, it, it can learn to, it can lead to the worst outcomes, uh, if not treated. It, 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 um, I think that people often, uh, the, the word is overused, it's used in a context that isn't um, correct, and what it needs to be used as, depression is an illness, it is an illness that is real, it exists in the brain, it actually physically exists in the brain, it's not imaginative, and it is fatal. That's the people. Right. That's the thing that people forget. They 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 forget that um, just because like depression does actually lead to death. Right. So it's not a joking matter. When somebody starts to um, sort of talk about how they don't want to live or how oh what would happen if I if I ended my life what would happen if I didn't exist you have to take that seriously because. There's only, it, it, like, once it crosses that threshold, there's no coming back from it. So you don't want to be that person that was like, oh, I didn't realize that that person was at that threshold and I didn't do anything. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's too late by then, right? Exactly. And, and the interesting thing is that um, I, I, I don't know how much this is, like, a general umbrella thing, but uh, I think all the survivors... Um, survivor the the suicide survivors that i have researched they all didn't want to die they actually regretted it in a way the moment it happened but it happened out of this complete desperation and um when people say like oh they took their own life or they killed themselves it sounds like they're the ones that are doing it and while there is an action there involved it comes if, if it's an action that oh, they did it to themselves, that implies that there's a decision. But there isn't a decision if you only see one way out. There's no, right. there's only one option. And, uh, and everybody who um, is suicidal, they actually don't want to not live. They just want to not feel the pain anymore. Right. That's, that's very well put. It's not a decision if you, don't, if you don't see any alternatives. It's the only way that you perceive, you know, the pain can go away which is not true, obviously. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people have this resistance towards medication, whether it you know, be taking aspirin for, for a headache, uh, but going more seriously, you know, taking, uh, taking antidepressants. Uh, but you said it was a game changer for you, but although like you resisted also, right? You didn't want to go that, down that route because um, a lot of people will have, you know, think about that, the negative health outcomes, they don't want to be dependent on those uh, or have prejudice towards those. But actually, as your doctor told you, you were at the point where it would be very hard, almost impossible to come back uh, to normalcy without um, uh, the use of drugs. For me, it was um, impossible to come back to the state of normalcy. And uh, But yeah, like you said, there's a huge stigma towards it. The stigma was in my own family. Um, I didn't want to tell my family that I was taking antidepressants because I actually would hear them talk about it before and be like, that's, you know, that's not the way. That's like the, that's the easy way out yeah. or something. Yeah. And 
but yeah, there's a lot of, um, there, I, I was afraid of taking them at first because the internet is a very scary place and everybody talks about the worst on the internet. And whenever I research something sure. like that, I would be terrified. Um, but the interesting thing is a lot of people tend to think that uh, medication destroys your personality or it destroys your creativity. Uh, so I've been a songwriter since I was 12. And I wrote hundreds and hundreds of songs a year. Um, when I started to go through these major depressive symptoms in my mid-20s, it became harder and harder to write to the point where if I wrote one song a year, that was, that was a success. Um, I started the medication in end of January. I wrote an entire album wow. in the first month after that. I mean, I haven't released it yet or anything, but right. like, yeah, but it's... I wrote it and it's a complete, like, it's, it's got like a beginning and an end. It's not just a whole bunch of songs together. No, it's... You, you, you started moving towards your goal and you got inspired again. Although a lot of people talk about, you know, hardship in life. Um, and it, it's true in many ways that it, it builds you as a character. Uh, sometimes going through hard phases in your life is an inspiration for art. Uh, you know, a lot of artists, um, acknowledge artists, are damaged in a way, you know, have gone through periods of time that sort of left an, a mark on them, and it, it sort of fueled their cre creativity. But we shouldn't equate that with the creative process in, in a disease that's actually hindering your um, everyday functioning and trying to kill you in, in, a, in a way. And, and it glorifies the whole concept of uh, geniuses and artists need to be depressed, which isn't true. It simply isn't. In fact, uh, if you look at look through history of all the musicians that have been successful, yes, there are some that have been addicts, some of the, that have been living with mental illness. But during the time when they were having the worst time of their addiction and their mental illness, they were having a terrible time in their careers. Uh, I mean, think of Amy Winehouse, yeah. a, a complete genius in, in music and, a, and an artist and, and incredibly self-disciplined. And when she was going through the worst period of her life, she could barely do a whole concert. Yeah. So there's no, th that myth of uh, artists or geniuses or there's madness and genius, genius and madness. It, it's simply not, it's not true. It's, it's a matter of, um, how much they can cope with it until it becomes completely destructive. Exactly. And, and I think it's a great point. And Amy Winehouse is maybe a great example of that. And it, it seems like it's, it's always either extremes of the spectrum, right? Um, uh, it's either glorifying um, the, the sort of the creative benefits of being depressed or uh, it's just a calling it out as a, um, not really a disease, not, not willing to grapple with what it actually is, uh, like a debilitating and a hard disease that will eventually, if not treated, uh, has the potential to, uh, uh, to kill you. Um, but let's go back to your story. Um, I think a lot of people can learn from um, somebody who's gone through it and talking about it. And thank you for coming here and actually sharing your story. I, I know it's not an easy, uh, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, can you go back to the place when, when you started realizing this is actually not the way uh, it should be uh, and, and figuring out that, you know, you might, you might need to go in and look for help? Um, so the, there was that moment uh, when, I wanted, when I gave up on life and when I, when I was like, I don't know when it's going to happen or how it's going to happen, but... I, this is it for me. I, I have, I don't, and the thing is that it's not that I didn't see a future. I did. I saw uh, the potential for a beautiful future, but I was like, I can't, I can't survive to live that long to wait for it. I just can't deal with it anymore. And uh, the most terrifying thing about that moment was that after that, I, w I felt peace and calmness. So when somebody uh, suddenly changes their behavior into being this serene, calm person, that's when you should be the most terrified for their life. Yeah, uh, and that, that's actually a great point. Uh, it, there's, a, there's a sudden change in the people that are suicidal, in some of them, when they realize th th that's, that's what they want to do because they see, find, they see finally an exit. Yeah. And then they, you know, they change their personality. They, they become uh, uh, you know, uh, more social. 
Uh, they talk with the family, with the friends, and then when everybody thinks they're they're getting better, actually it's it's because uh, um, yeah. there's something much darker uh, beneath that uh, uh, life change. Yes, and it, and it is incredibly dark. Um, I that day when I went when 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 I when it almost claimed my life, basically, um, I actually I went to church because I. I'm a choir director. I was a choir director in, in, in a church before, and now I am in another church. And I had just uh, composed um, a song that we were singing in church, and I was like, "I'm not going to miss this." You know, I, w- I want to, you know, I want to hear that. I want to, I want to sing that. So, I went to church, and the crazy thing is, during that period, it was like I was trying to latch onto something for life. So, um, every single thing that somebody said to me, I was like, "Should I or shouldn't I?" and then um, at mass, I, I, I know what the readings are, but I don't know them right now off my heart. But it was just like, it really felt like um, God was saying, no, you have to come back. Um, it, was, it was lines like, um, th- there's this line that has always in my entire life been very important to me where it's like, um, you will hold my people in your in your arms and in your hearts, you were the one that are going to take care of the people. And it, it became about a calling. It became about you can't give up yet. And it, there was also that reading where um, Peter throws the net on one side of the boat and there's no fish. Yeah. And then he's told to throw it on the other side of the boat and then there's fish. But he, but he said first, look, there's not going to be anything. But if you tell me, I will toss the net again. And I was like, it just kept... Yeah. booming in my head and, and that that's actually what saved my life and in in a moment a week later I I made a decision to never get there again because it felt like absolute hell it was complete darkness uh like you said it was very dark and the thing is that living with depression is absolute hell but going through suicide actual suicide that is hell like it's it's I mean it may sound abstract but Honestly, it was like there were, you know, those, like, gargoyles around and everything. Um, I don't mean to make it so... I, I, uh, but anyways, uh, that's what led me to my... Um, t- to seek help, because when I felt that way again, I didn't have... I, I removed that option, and I knew that I had to find help somewhere. That's when I walked into uh, the Clinic for Prevention of Suicide, which, by the way, was very difficult to find by Googling, I don't understand why these things are difficult to find. Um, and it's also, uh, nobody, most people don't really know how to tell you what to, where to look for help. Because, yeah, they undermine what you're going through, but also they don't really know, people don't know how to give advice. And uh, yeah. that, that's something that needs to change because these things need to be well known enough so that if somebody is struggling, um, when somebody sees that, um, because that's what we need. We need people that have more empathy, people that look at people and see that they're struggling and know how to say, look, you, you should talk to someone. You should talk to a therapist, a counselor, um, even a friend for starters. But when it gets deep, you need to go somewhere further. So that's, that's where it came from. It came from that desperation. I ended up finding a therapist that I um, talked to quite a bit. She was the one that seven years later said, okay, now it's time for to take this, you know, to a psychiatrist. And I remember um, that I decided, okay, I'm going to do that because I can't live like this anymore. Like, I, to clarify what that looked like in my life, um, I couldn't get out of bed until sundown for a whole year, year and a half. I would just lie in bed all day. Um, I, I couldn't. I just couldn't. And I was living alone at that time, so nobody could see that. Uh, but if I was living with somebody, like when I was living with my family before, they just felt like, oh, you need to activate yourself more. You just yeah. need to be more, um, like... Try going for a walk. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And that's the thing. People say, you know, um, exercise exercise helps. And yes, it does. It does. But when, here's the thing. When I got into my first major depressive um, episode, I had been training three times a week, boxing, a sport that I loved. I was social, I had friends, I was volunteering, I was eating healthy, and just little by little, it started to fall. And, and, and so it's not, it's not as simple as take a walk or yeah. go 
running or whatever, or hang out with friends or go out. It seems like a seems like a you know people feel like they're helping by saying that because you know I guess being helpless on the other side when somebody shares this finally comes out and says you know I'm depressed. I've even been, been, you know, feeling suicidal. It's hard. And then I guess the first need is just to say something. And you're like, well, you should try going for a walk or doing some sports. And it, I think it has the negative effect, although it might help. Uh, but just saying this, it just undermines the, the severity of the problem and makes people feel even more uh, misunderstood um, and stops them from, you know, coming out again and, and talking about those problems oh, yes. more. Oh, yes. Uh, the most important thing is to, is, is to listen to people. Literally, just listen and, be, and say, wow, that sounds really tough on you. And that's it. You just need to listen to people, reach out with your empathy, and, um, and validate their emotions. Like you're not looking for a solution. Like you didn't say this to them because you want... Uh, an advice or quick solution like you can't say anything in a couple of words that will you know cure my depression yes exactly. but i needed to share this right yeah you need you need to share you need to have somebody that you can that will listen to you without judgment and that's what we need to be for each other we're not meant to be therapists unless we are actually licensed therapists therapists spend a lot of their life educating themselves and yeah. training themselves to become to come to that point when if you're not that you can be an essential part of somebody's mental health uh, process by simply being a friend. Simply being there. That's a lot of people, even through this pandemic, people have been going through um, uh, uh, a phase of, you know, um, um, uh, depression or feeling anxious or, you know, just spurring some problems that might have uh, happened before. It all comes back. You know, people are under a lot of stress. And a lot of pe people sort of call me, or a lot of my colleagues are also psychologists being asking for help. Where can I look for help? And that's actually touches upon what you said before. Uh, you're in this deeply troubled state and you need help. And then it's hard to find. So it, making the move towards finding help is a big decision on your side. And then that's a big step. But then you need to find help and that's hard. And anything, any, any uh, obstacle along the way can deter you. Uh, and it's it's hard to see this that you know the, although there is help, it's it's hard to find. That's why we you know try to help sort of solve part of it by by creating this platform. But I think the thing that I try to say to all my friends, even if they're not psychologists, if somebody comes to you with a problem, we don't like they don't teach us these occult, mystical uh, uh, ways of helping people. Uh, first step is basically what you said it's just being there and listening like psychological counseling for the most part is just being really good at listening to people and you know rephrasing what they said uh reflecting what they said helping them hear what they're saying um and it's a skill and it takes time but everyone can do this we've been doing this for as long as there's language in in you know human race uh but stop with the advice and just be there and listen, and then maybe we can uh, try and help them to find the help. But you know, you you don't need to help the person that comes out and, and says they have a problem. You don't need to come in and offer the solution, like go and have a walk, yeah, uh, or, or think positive thoughts. Which, oh yeah, that's look that helps. We're not <laughs> saying that it doesn't, but I mean, do you think I haven't tried that? I mean, yeah. So so w you started therapy. Uh, yes, I, I started therapy. Um, I, I remember when my therapist told me to go to a psychiatrist, I kept saying, okay, I'm going to go, but I kept putting it week after week, putting it off. And she's like, look, you have to go now. Like, stop putting it off. And I drove up to the psychiatric hospital. I chickened out and went away. Um, there's something so terrifying about a sign that says psychiatric hospital, mm. um, mainly because... I, I think it's because of the stigma. I think it's because of this feeling like this is real. Um, and I was so terrified, but I, I did finally go. And I, I, there, it was the most terrifying thing, just walking through, walking past that sign, walking through those doors. Um, but it was also the best thing that I could have ever done. 
And now whenever I come back for checkups, I actually enjoy coming there because it is such a positive place. I mean, not every hospital is the same. Not right. every therapist is the same. Uh, but that was, that was crucial. The thing that um, I, I think of when I look back at that moment was I was alone. But I didn't have to be. I just thought that I had... I thought that there yeah. was nobody that could go with me because... Um, my closest friend, she was, uh, she had a relapse with her um, chronic illness, so she couldn't come. My sister was living uh, abroad, so I thought, well, who can I take with me? Um, because I didn't really trust anyone else. And, and then I realized I do have more friends that I could have asked. I just didn't see it then. And that's the most terrifying thing about somebody being in this state where they feel completely alone, but they're not alone. There are people around. It, yep. We just don't know how to reach out. We just don't know how to, how to see that. Yeah, what, are, what, are the, what are the big steps in, let's say, cognitive behavior therapy, which helps a lot with uh, anxious disorders, uh, depressive disorders, is plowing through these misconceptions of the world, right? So people think, you know, I'm a complete failure, I have no friends, everything I do uh, is wrong, nothing will ever go my way, and you need to start chipping away those, uh, those misperceptions of, of the world around you step by step like is it really that you don't have anybody what about your best friend well yeah i have her but you know mm -hmm. or is it really that nothing ever goes your way uh tell me one thing that you succeeded in the last week and then you say this one thing and you're like oh wow okay so all of these perceptions just slowly start going away yeah, it becomes an um an everything or nothing yeah uh, which is where we get lost in yeah. those thoughts and yeah cognitive behavioral therapy makes it more um, br brings it to the reality, which is not uh, so black and white. And sure, and, uh, and this is the, the the step where I think medication comes in, because sometimes it's it's hard to see this if you're in a bad place in emotions. They put these the, uh, well intensive emotions generally form a sort of a, a tunnel vision in in humans, and you only tend to focus on on the thing that's important now. If it's you know a, a source of uh, danger uh, or you know negative negative feelings by the sort of tunnel vision you, and then medications can clear that away so you can start thinking about um, other, other yes, things. Yes, because uh, medication fixes the parts of the brain or improves the parts of the brain that are damaged. And that's something that, um, uh, I put the book right there, this is Depression, uh, which is by Di Dr. Diane McIntosh. Um, this book actually really shaped my um, life in the sense that it gave me this understanding of what actually is happening in the brain because she explains it she this is this isn't this is this is a book for people that for non-professionals right um and she explains exactly every single part of the brain and how it reacts within with these mental with the mental illness of this is depre of depression and and what exactly is being repaired through therapy through um through medication and and everything and it, it's just and it de demystifies your brain basically right so what were before just these unpleasant feelings now you know how they come about and why right yeah and, and where they are manifesting it, it makes it real in the sense that it's not made up because that's the thing it's not you're allowed to feel this way you're allowed to feel horrible depressed miserable um, but it's not, it's not something that you have to feel, and it, it's not the final solution. There is always another solution, and it is really tough to find sometimes, and sometimes you have to look hard for it, but you just have to keep pushing. That's a, that's a beautiful message to sort of uh, wrap this talk up. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for sharing your experience, and I wish you all the luck for the future. Thank you.